quadrature phase shift keying, or QPSK for short, is a variation of BPSK that allows twice as much digital data to be transmitted for a given bandwidth. It also provides a foundation for a number of other important modulation techniques. In this lesson, you'll learn how QPSK works. You'll also meet a number of variations of QPSK, including offset QPSK, differential QPSK, and 8 PSK. QPSK modulation takes advantage of an interesting feature of linear superposition. We've seen that if two waves meet in phase, the resulting wave will be the two original waves added together. Varying the amplitude of one or the other will change only the amplitude of the resulting wave. However, if two waves meet 90 degrees out of phase, or to use the technical term, if they are in quadrature, then the phase of the resulting wave will be halfway between the two. Here you can see a sine wave and a cosine wave, which are, by definition, 90 degrees out of phase. Changing the amplitude of one or the other causes a phase shift in the resulting wave. If the amplitude of the sine wave is zero, the resultant wave matches the cosine wave exactly. And if the amplitude of the cosine wave is zero, the resultant wave is an exact match of the sine wave. This means we can describe the phase and amplitude of any sinusoidal wave in terms of the amplitude of a sine wave plus the amplitude of a cosine wave. Another fundamental feature of QPSK is the clever way in which line coding is done. QPSK begins by splitting each adjacent pair of binary digits within the original serial data stream into separate data streams. So each symbol is made up of a pair of parallel bits, also known as a die bit. Each new sequence is converted into polar NRZ format, so that a 1 is represented by a positive voltage and a 0 is represented by a negative voltage, just like in BPSK. If pulse shaping is going to be employed, then it happens at this stage of the process. In the previous lesson, you saw that a digital signal is sampled to generate a stream of discrete impulses. Overlapping sync functions are calculated for these impulses, and then they're added together to produce a smoothed out 2 pam signal. Pulse shaped QPSK would give us two 2 pam signals at this point. To help make the essence of QPSK easier to visualize, we'll continue this discussion without consideration of pulse shaping. Two carrier waves are now generated. Their amplitudes and frequencies are identical, but they are in quadrature. That is, they are exactly 90 degrees out of phase with each other. Each carrier is amplitude modulated separately with one of the digital signals, just like in BPSK. A sudden voltage change causes the carrier wave to invert. Typically, these modulated data signals are referred to as I, which stands for in phase, and Q, which stands for quadrature. The BPSK waves are then added together, and the overall voltage is adjusted. Now, because I and Q are 90 degrees out of phase, there is a phase shift in the resulting wave whenever there's a change in either I or Q. This means there are now four distinct waveforms available to encode binary data, each with a unique phase angle. Indeed, another name for QPSK is 4PSK. Because there are four of them, each waveform can represent a pair of binary digits. This means QPSK can carry twice as much data for the same bandwidth as BPSK. Here's what a random sequence of bits would look like when modulated using QPSK. The process of generating a QPSK signal can be summarized as you can see here. The key features are splitting the original data stream to create two separate streams. The generation of a carrier wave, which is duplicated, then a 90 degree phase shift applied to the copy. 
the individual carriers are modulated by separate mixers to give I and Q. Then I and Q are added together by a linear summer. Demodulation in a QPSK receiver is essentially the modulation process in reverse. The receiver needs to generate a local carrier, that is, a continuous wave at the same frequency and phase as the original carrier. A copy of the local carrier is made, a 90 degree phase shift applied, and the original data are extracted. Matching the frequency of the local carrier to the original carrier is not difficult, but synchronizing the phase is problematic. One approach is to build a receiver that can extract the original carrier from the incoming signal. This is called a coherent receiver. But coherent receivers are complex and expensive to build. We'll take a look at an alternative approach to the synchronization problem in a moment. QPSK modulation can be usefully described on a special chart known as a constellation diagram. The axes are labelled I and Q, and the values on the axes represent the voltage levels of the polar NRZ signals that were used to generate the modulated wave. A vector represents the amplitude and phase of each waveform, which is shown as a constellation point. Look closely and you'll see that the waveform for symbol 11 is a sine wave displaced by 45 degrees. This phase angle can be calculated from the values of I and Q using simple trigonometry. The waveform for 0, 01 is displaced by 135 degrees, 00, 0 225 degrees, and 10, 315 degrees. The I and Q coordinates of each constellation point correspond to the pair of bits encoded by each waveform. Since all four waveforms have the same amplitude, they lie on a circle. Even with a simplified version of the diagram, it's clear that there's a minimum separation of 90 degrees between any two waveforms. This is important because noise can cause the amplitude of I and Q to fluctuate, which in turn creates phase fluctuations that make it more difficult for the receiver to distinguish one symbol from another. As long as the constellation points are clustered together, 90 degrees provides plenty of room to manoeuvre. The diagram also shows that a phase jump from any one waveform to another can be as much as 180 degrees. And this presents a challenge. Consider this baseband signal. Here it is after line coding. Here are the individual modulated carriers, I and Q. Notice that I and Q might change phase at the same time. Whenever this happens, there's a phase jump of 180 degrees in the combined signal. Big phase jumps are undesirable because they generate high frequency components in the final signal, which reduce its overall spectral efficiency. Big phase jumps also create unwanted noise in the receiver, which can cause amplitude and phase fluctuations. A variation of QPSK, known as Offset QPSK, or OQPSK for short, tackles this problem by introducing a phase difference of 45 degrees between the two data components before they're processed. This means that I and Q will never change at the same time. There are now twice as many phase changes in the final signal, but the maximum possible phase change is only 90 degrees. The benefits of offset QPSK can be seen on a constellation diagram. With regular QPSK, it's possible to jump from any symbol to any other symbol, as shown by the diagonal lines through the centre of the circle. With OQPSK, on the other hand, if two symbols are separated by 180 degrees, then in order to change from one to the other, it's necessary to move through a different symbol first. Of course, OQPSK requires a more complex demodulator once the signal has been received. However, amplitude and frequency fluctuations are considerably reduced when compared with QPSK, which means the rate at which bit errors occur is much lower. Another variation of QPSK, known as differential 
QPSK, or DQPSK for short, provides a solution to the synchronization problem faced by the receiver. Rather than using absolute phase to distinguish one waveform from another, which is how QPSK works, DQPSK uses the phase difference between successive pairs of waveforms to specify each symbol. For example, to encode this sequence of bits with regular QPSK, it's just a matter of generating the right waveforms in the right order. But if the demodulator's local carrier is out of phase with the transmitter's carrier, these waveforms could well be misinterpreted. With DQPSK, a phase difference is assigned to each symbol, as shown in this table. Now, imagine that the transmitter has just generated a waveform with an absolute phase of 45 degrees. By the way, we can't know what symbol this waveform represents unless we know what came before it. To encode the next symbol, the first of our sequence, 0, 1, then according to the table, there should be a phase difference of 90 degrees from the previous waveform. Since the previous waveform had an absolute phase of 45 degrees, the next one will have a phase of 135 degrees, because 135 minus 45 is 90. To encode 0, 1 again, we need another phase difference of 90 degrees from the previous waveform. This time, the previous waveform has an absolute phase of 135 degrees, so the next one will have an absolute phase of 225 degrees, because 225 minus 135 gives us the 90 we're looking for. The table shows that the following bit pair, 0, 0, is represented by a phase difference of 0. The phase of the previous symbol was 225 degrees, so the next one will also have a phase of 225 degrees. 1, 0 is represented by a phase difference of minus 90 degrees. The previous waveform had a phase of 225, so the next one will have a phase of 135 degrees. 135 minus 225 is minus 90. 1, 1 is represented by a phase difference of 180 degrees. 315 minus 135 is 180. Finally, a 90 degree phase difference represents 0, 1. The calculation is not so obvious. The next waveform has an absolute phase of 45 degrees, because 45 minus 315 is minus 270, which is equivalent to positive 90. Think carefully about this approach and you'll see that the transmitter is using binary data to change the phase of the signal rather than set it. At the receiving end, the DQPSK demodulator can establish which symbol is encoded by a particular waveform by taking its absolute phase and subtracting the phase of the waveform that came before it. DQPSK, therefore, doesn't rely on knowing the phase of the original carrier. DQPSK receivers are much cheaper to build than coherent receivers, but the bit error rate is about twice that of regular QPSK. This is because every waveform in a signal might be affected by noise, and every symbol is acting as a reference for the next. DQPSK is nevertheless widely used by mobile phones, cable modems, and Bluetooth. There are several other variations of QPSK, but one in particular that's worth a mention is 8PSK. An 8PSK transmitter handles bits from the binary data stream in groups of three. The first two of the group are designated Q and I. The third is referred to as C. The value of C is fed into a two to four level converter, along with I. Meanwhile, the complement of C is fed into another 2 to 4 level converter along with Q. Notice the use of a NOT gate which converts 1s to zeros and zeros to 1s. Each 2 to 4 level converter takes two bits as input, and depending on which of four possible combinations of 1 and 0 it receives, outputs one of four possible voltages. 
You'll meet the 2 to 4 level converter again in the next lesson when we look at QAM. We now have two parallel signals, which between them, at any point in time, encode three bits of the original data stream. By the way, pulse shaping could be applied at this stage. The two signals are then amplitude modulated with separate carriers that are 90 degrees out of phase, and the modulated signals are added together in the same way as regular QPSK. Each group of three bits from the original data stream is now represented by one of eight possible waveforms, each with a unique phase. An 8PSK transmitter is more complex than a QPSK transmitter, but 8PSK has one and a half times the data rate of QPSK. The voltage levels for I and Q were deliberately chosen to ensure equal separation between the phase angles of the eight possible waveforms, as can be seen on this constellation diagram. As can also be seen, the phase change between any two waveforms in an 8PSK signal can be as little as 45 degrees. This has the benefit of reducing the bandwidth of the signal, but it also makes it more difficult for the receiver to distinguish one symbol from another. The bit error rate is therefore higher in 8PSK than QPSK. Theoretically, the symbol rate can be scaled up even further using the same principle as 8PSK. For example, 4 bits per symbol could be encoded using one of 16 possible waveforms, namely 16 PSK. Or 5 bits per symbol would allow for 32 PSK. In practice, wireless applications rarely go beyond 8 PSK. The bit error rate for higher order PSK simply isn't practical. Both QPSK and 8PSK are widely used in satellite television broadcasting. QPSK is mainly used to deliver standard definition content. 8PSK, on the other hand, is better for high definition.